Good afternoon, everyone, and welcome to our next edition of the Half Hour Hot Topics. We are very excited for today's session today. Um, I'm Shannon Kupka with Health Insight, the project manager working with the nursing home folks. And this Half Hour Hot Topics is brought to you by the Department of Health, the New Mexico Healthcare Association, and Health Insight, and also our uh, Partners for Quality Care work group. We are very excited today to have our um, presenter, Dr. Lena Ernst. Uh, Lena Ernst is the CEO and director of the Retreat Healthcare, and she'll be talking with us today about non-pharmacological approaches to behavioral expression. Lena had kindly done our very first Half Hour Hot Topic series webinar, so we are, um, again, delighted she can come back and join us today. Thank you. I'm going to go ahead and start, and there's a lot of information to do in 30 minutes and a lot of slides. I am going to really move through it, but know that I'll try to leave a few um, minutes for questions. And, and this is clearly an overview, but hopefully it will get folks interested or started or answer some questions you've been wondering about. When we talk about non-pharmacological, we want to really go back to those basics and really and as you are doing your own training in your own programs, always start with that idea of dementia and what it is. And so certainly we did this in part one. You would do it in, in your own part one in your facilities, but really describing what dementia is all about. Today, we're just gonna literally just touch on a few points and then move straight to interventions. So when we talk about dementia, clearly it is this idea of brain failure, brain dysfunction. And it's a big umbrella word with a lot of different types of dementia or forms of dementia. Um, sometimes I often use the analogy of crayons, a box of crayons. They are all crayons, but one may be called yellow, one is blue, one is green. So people can understand there are many types or forms of dementia, but that syndrome of dementia is talking about cognitive dysfunction. When we start to think about interventions, non-pharmacological interventions, we really want to start with this idea of a changing paradigm. And we see that Dr. Power often used this kind of description where he's saying um, to talk about the basis of your programs being a way that we understand that folks are now seeing and experiencing the world in a different way due to that brain dysfunction. So here we see a couple holding hands, going through the park, perhaps in a very familiar place they've been many, many times before, and we can picture the joy that they might experience doing this simple activity. When we change the paradigm and think about perhaps our lady in the picture now having an advanced dementia, we can really use this as a talking point with your staff or with groups about how this experience is now changed because this person now with dementia may experience the same activity in a different way. And how can we make it more pleasurable? How can we enhance it? And certainly for her husband, how has the experience changed for him? This is that idea that, that their world will feel different and be different and we are entering that world to enhance the positive aspects of the world as they live in it, as they see it. When we talk about dementia, it is, it is very highly likely that during the course of that illness for any given patient, they're going to have some level of distress. We see here a, a current statistic that has been very consistent over the years as, as we studied this idea of what we call neuropsychic or, or the, the symptoms of dementia, that a very high percentage of folks with dementia are going to show this behavioral expression. And what is behavioral expression? It really is the behaviors, the symptoms coming forward to communicate with us a need. There's something happening that they want us to know about, an unmet need, or something we've done that did not meet the need as they perceive it. And we think of these behaviors, these symptoms, as a, a form of communication. We call it behavioral expression, not bad behavior or not behavior problems. We certainly don't want to use that term of anxiety or, or uh, disruption as in a negative connotation. So when we think about 
the symptoms, the behaviors as being a form of expression, communication. It helps us to enter that world we want to go to. And we can have all kinds of pain. We can have physical pain, and a lot of us can relate to that. Your knee is swollen, it hurts, it's swollen, and you provide interventions, Tylenol and, and elevation, and all the things you would do if somebody was in physical pain. But we, when we think of psychological pain, emotional pain, we still want to think of it as pain. Somebody is in need, and it is our job as the caretaker, as I always think of ourselves as sort of being the prosthetic, the missing piece in order to make people feel more whole. We are that person helping to identify that pain, that distress, that unmet need, and finding ways to turn it around. So the preferred term over behavioral problem really is behavioral expression. And even as you start your own work in building up your non-pharmacological programs, I always go back to the basics, which is the discussion of dementia, the discussion of behavioral expression, and talking about some of these neuropsychiatric uh, features or the symptoms of, of behavior. And we'll look at that. And they happen throughout dementia. They come and go. And I always say that to families. It, one particular behavior may feel difficult today, um, but you may almost miss it later on because as they rise and peak, they will go away. Other behaviors will take their place, and it is the, it is the uh, issue of dementia that we are somewhat chasing behavior or chasing symptom to find those ways to make people more comfortable. It is not static. As the brain is changing, as it is deteriorating, the, the behavioral expression will change and their ways of communicating need will also change. So we want to look at <clears throat> what we call behavioral expression. And, and these are, from research, the most common that we see. And I would bet anybody uh, in watching today involved in this training has seen all of these behaviors. So we're talking about yelling or shouting, perseverative behaviors, which are banging or clicking or tapping, constant requests for help. They may be verbal. They may be saying, help, help, come here, come here. Um, sometimes not knowing what they need, uncooperation with care, pushing, yelling, just saying no, verbal threatening, wandering, moving things, hoarding, shopping, as I like to call it, temper, outbursts, or irritability, biting, grabbing, sleeping problems, eating problems, and all of the, that bucket of, of, of being uh, um, sometimes what people would term as socially inappropriate, whether that is with undressing, sexual behavior, verbal behavior. These are some of the most common behavioral expressions. You can also think of them as types of neuropsychiatric features, and they're common with dementia. So if you choose to work with the dementia population, you really want to be expecting the behavioral expression, learn to be okay with the behavioral expression, and that leads us into then, what do we do with it? How do we manage that behavior in population or at home? And how do we find creative ways to reduce distress? Ultimately, that is the goal, and I even could, could encourage you to use that on a care plan as a goal. Your goal is to reduce distress, to replace distress with joy. What we're trying to do, and even for you and I, we are not joyful all day, every day. But every day we find things that we find pleasure in. Music, talking with your family, a drive in the park, your favorite ice cream. These are things that we do to make sure that our days are filled with joy and balanced against the difficulties of life. We certainly wanna do this for folks with dementia and help bring that joy where there was once distress. We always wanna start when we're looking at these behaviors or expressions, what is the driving force? And you always start with unmet physical needs. If a new behavior shows itself suddenly, you always want to assess well for other reasons. 
other than just change in dementia behaviors first. Are they thirsty? Are they hungry? Is there an infection starting? Is something going on with medication? Are their shoes too tight? Are they cold? What could be that unmet physical need? We always want to start there first. There is a role for medications, but really we're looking at the non-pharmacological interventions first. And we use medications when we really have felt that the non-pharmacological on their own have been unsuccessful or where there is great safety risk. That's another whole discussion of how we think through, assess, and manage the combination of medication and non-pharmacological, but we know we start with non-pharmacological first. So we want to have a big toolbox, a bucket of possible interventions to use before going to medications. We also know through the research that the non-pharmacological interventions have been found to be just as beneficial. And so we see here a, a, a quote where non-pharmacological interventions have the potential to reduce the frequency and severity of the neuropsychiatric behaviors with effect sizes, which means with the, with the benefit or the quality equaling those of medicine. And so when we talk about the time we give to how we manage medicines, learn about medicines and give it, we want to talk about are we giving that equal amount of time, effort, and training in the non-pharmacological. We're really trying to contribute to personhood. That's what we're really after. Definitely, we want to manage those non-pharmacological uh, programs, but in a way that is focused to each individual person. One intervention is not going to work for every resident. And sometimes you're doing combinations of interventions. So let's talk about those. We talk about these in terms of complementary therapies. And most of you have almost all of these. It's really formalizing how you think about it, changing how we train to it, and really thinking about these just like you think about medications. It, it, what are your go-to options when we're thinking about how to manage these different uh, presentations of behavior and expression? Music, aroma, touch, pets, People, I add people because that one-to-one -one that we're able to do or volunteers fall in that category. Art therapy, access to nature, multi-step sensory stimulation, meaningful activity. It's meaningful if it's meaningful to the resident. Spiritual, and I left but don't want to leave out. Changes in lighting, that's unique. What that's really saying is that we need to think about the behaviors stemming from the brain and the changes in the brain, and the brain reacts to all kinds of sensory stimulation. So we think about aromas and touch, but don't forget the wind on your face if you sit outside, the change of the lighting in your room can all change how your brain is thinking and functioning, and could be used in positive ways. And finally, communication training. To me, I highlighted it, to, it's the most important. It's hard to do these other non-pharmacological, if you haven't yet entered that world of teaching good communication, good dementia communication to your staff. And again, maybe another topic for a hot topic. We talk about activities, but I prefer the, the term engagement because I think it's wider and broader. And when we look at our engagement opportunities, these are also our opportunities for intervention to reduce distress and increase joy. And that is the role of non-pharmacological. So we have reminiscence and life sharing, creativity in the arts, imagination and mind challenge, personal care and learning to see how just the, the interaction of perhaps brushing somebody's hair is really a positive intervention for behavioral expression and can be used and seen in that way. Community involvement, music, movement, physical fun, spiritual activities and environments. Volunteerism, and I say that specifically, not necessarily outside volunteers in, but volunteers resident to resident. Parties, uh, children, nature, all the things we know about.
in the last part of the presentation, I'm going to show a bunch of pictures. And it is not to give you examples of just joy. I hope that you see some joy in these particular residents. But it is to remind you that most of the folks that I have worked with and might be represented in these photos could have been identified at one time as being distressed, agitated, irritable, wandering, perseverative behavior, yelling, shopping, hoarding, all the things that we talk about. But when you see a snapshot of somebody who's had good intervention, really what you see is a happy senior, somebody with the feeling of joy, even if it's temporary. So here we look at redirection. It's a term we always use, but how much do we understand it? It is time with no purpose transformed into purposeful time. How can we take someone who either feels lack of purpose or is lost in a thought or a behavior and transform it or redirect it into something positive? So we have a picture here of women at the table, but we can also imagine that one or two of those folks could have been highly wandering or very agitated, but with some structure, turn it into a positive group. We see a picture of folks doing some gardening. That's actually a maintenance gentleman who thought somebody outside looking uncomfortable could add, be added to an activity and turn it into joy. We talk about music and the way to use music. And a lot of you have had a lot of training or thought about how to do it. I will say from personal experience, it's certainly easier said than done, but to expand as much of that as you can. Structured would be those group activities that we do where we bring in music or we share music. Private and personal, the iPods, the headphone systems that many of us are using, individualized with that person's interest level. It could be where an activity was meant to be one thing, but turned into a music event. And here we see a picture of somebody just standing up in great joy, but really what we don't know is the backstory was that this person was coming into an activity very irritable and with the use of music was able to change the direction of that behavior. It can be spontaneous, people finding music in the, in the atmosphere or the environment. And here we see a, a, a resident with headphones on, also with a blanket that has aromatherapy. She was a resident who had what we call perseverative speech. She yelled out a lot, ow, ow, ow. And yet with her Portuguese love songs, she is not asleep. She is listening to the music and it for 20 minutes had relief of that behavior. Will it last all day, every day? No but 20 minutes is a success. And you wanna think of non-pharmacological in that way. For moments of time, can you change a distressful situation into a positive situation? Here we have spirituality in nature. And, and spirituality is bigger than religion. It is really finding something that connects for that person, all the background information you get on people become very important in terms of what non-pharmacological uh, intervention you might be able to use. And sometimes just providing access to the outdoors, to solitude. In this picture, somebody looking at a religious object important to her with the calm of solitude in the sunshine. Aromatherapy is hard to do and easy to do. You can make it as simple as you want it or as complex as you want it. One of these photos shows a, a, a cabinet of developed aromas that were designed for particular issues all the way from uh, constipation to anxiety. But it could be a simpler approach with even getting essential oils, using it. This was a gentleman who could be very irritable during that sundowning time, looking to exit, wanting to go home, but also loved the smell of coffee. And so we're able to identify smells were joyful to him. And this was going through different smells, whether it's lavender or grapefruit, and what, is it, what does it do for them? And it's temporary, but it redirects an uncomfortable situation to comfortable. 
We also have that idea of touch and massage. It can be structured. Some of you may be bringing in massage therapists. Wonderful, but hard to do for a great number of people. But you can teach basic touch at shoulders, perhaps at hands, using lotions, and you can teach folks and give them permission that by doing gentle, appropriate touch, that interaction, that engagement can change the brain momentarily to say, I'm not going to be thinking about this thought. I'm going to break the, the circular thought I'm in or the feeling of distress I'm feeling can be broken by having human touch. But you can do it here, an example of just doing nails with music. So we have two different interventions happening at the same time. On, the, on one other side, you see a gentleman with his feet um, getting a soak because he's gonna have a massage to his feet, but popcorn in his hands. What you didn't see earlier was that he continually was trying to take off his, his oxygen, very distressed, getting very agitated. So the picture is misleading because it looks like somebody just in a state of joy, and that's what we're after, but you don't see the previous moments where there was the distress. And that's how you learn to think about non-pharmacological, that a moment of distress, adding an element, whatever that might be, but doing it sometimes in combination, if it doesn't work, you try something else. Nobody said this was easy, but with excitement, enthusiasm, and teaching folks to think of everything as a possible intervention, if it brings you joy, it's a possible non-pharmacological intervention. Here, pets and animals, a resident here with his own animal, his own dog that his wife brought, but also outside, so you're combining nature with the pet. Here in a structured activity, an actual pony coming to, to excite and, and have somebody who normally, this person was normally very apathetic, highly depressed, seeing a different reaction. And then you see in, the, in another picture, um, the mechanical or artificial animals that sometimes can be used. This is a robotic cat that is often used and moves and, and makes sounds and is able to keep a person who normally would have been having her hands in the air, seeking help, now has her hands used and feels purposeful by making the cat feel comfortable. Volunteerism is talked about a lot, but I think that there's a missing component of resident to resident volunteerism. So a picture of a resident with a staff person who's been recruited to provide humor and make another resident feel happy that day. And her job was to collect smiles. That's what she understood her job to be. Otherwise, this could have been a resident who was very irritable, seeking, searching, shopping, going into other rooms because there was a need not met. But momentarily, whether it's 10 minutes or 30 minutes, had purpose by collecting smiles and did it in this way. Volunteerism of helping, even if the caregiver is making that activity happen, it's still resident to resident. And then, of course, intergenerational, whether that is with your families that come in, recruiting uh, schools in your area, uh, bringing other, uh, uh, we've, we've been involved with charter schools that have a great interest in trading knowledge. I'll teach the kids about uh, getting older or normal aging or dementia, and you bring the kids and let's do some shared um, programming. Very positive for folks who might need different kinds of direction. And ultimately, some of those that we're most familiar with, all the traditional activities of arts and creativity, but I really highlight art because it can be so unique and personal. This is where you can do life sharing, have people talk about stories, and for residents who have lost language, the art programs that we have seen come out of big national groups and very small programs that I've been just delighted to see where folks who may not be able to communicate in regular traditional ways have been able to use art. 
chores and movement. And here's a resident, again, who would get very agitated at certain times of the day, needed work. And so cleaning the water fountain became very important. But it could be fun and dancing. Ultimately, in the last minute or so, I want to give you this idea that non-pharmacological is really about solving problems. We used to think it was about solving our problem, which is that resident having a behavior that was difficult, but it's really about solving their problem, their problem of distress or anxiety or of need. Here's a picture of someone, actually he was a coach, thought he was always supposed to be um, out on the football field coaching his team at a particular time of day. So where should he be at that time of day? He should be outside. For him, that would have been important. So thinking about what their problem is, where do they think their needs are, listening with an open, uh, open ear and trying to solve those problems that create the expression that we see as behaviors in creative ways. We are not able to undo dementia. We cannot stop brain cells from dying, but we can make people more comfortable. And so our job is to identify these behaviors, look for root causes, certainly identify if there's a medical condition creating it, but ultimately having a huge toolbox of interventions that we try to turn distress into joy. I think that I'm happy to be with you. I'm sorry it's only 30 minutes. It's such a huge topic. I hope it gives you something to think about. Pick one if you want to really just get started. If you've got three or four and something came up today that you're not doing a lot of, work on that one. Take it in bite-sized pieces. And if there are questions in the last minute or two, I am certainly happy um, to answer that. Um, Shannon, and if there's not questions, I will just give a little bit more information about maybe getting started on these programs. Great. Thank you very much, Lena. Very informative information. We did have a couple questions in chat. Um, we'll start with those. And please, if you have questions that you've just thought of, please go ahead and enter that into chat as well. Um, Donald had asked if you could expound on uh, multisensory stimulation. And we also had a question from Janet about a resource for essential oils. Okay, all right, so let's do essential oils first. Um, there's lots online, I will tell you that, and any more because it's become popular. There are some recipes, or you can buy them already, and you can go to all the websites, basically for massage, spas, you'll have them there. If you can seek out somebody who has done aromatherapy, I happen to have a nurse who is certified in, in, aroma, in aromatherapy, that's awesome, but they're hard to find. Sometimes you can find massage therapists who also have advanced training in aromatherapy. But with a little research and starting with the basics, the basic essential oils that we know have a relationship to certain behavior, you can start small and grow. Use diffusers, do sprays, you can spray it on pieces of cloth, you can put it in diffusers, and you certainly can make lotions out of basic lotion, adding the aromatherapy essential oil. On multi-sensory stimulation, I think the biggest message is don't overdo it. I think that sometimes we think that by providing every activity at every moment and having everybody in it all the time is the answer, and that is actually not true. We know that there's a certain population within that dementia diagnosis that is overstimulated. And so it's a balance of finding those activities that are meaningful and, and balancing that with also meaningful rest. When we talk about multisensory, it the sky is the limit. When you bake bread in the in the unit with a bread maker, you're doing aromatherapy. When you bring out tactile or surface items to play a game and and what does this make you think of? And you have a cotton ball and you have a spaghetti. That, that's some sort of tactile stimulation. It's probably what we can do the best and have been doing for a long time. I think the problem has been sometimes we're not directing it toward the needs of that particular behavior set. If someone is very irritable in large groups, you're not going to take them to the big music event necessarily. Maybe that's when you're using headphones. So I guess the message is anything sensory is on the table, but how do you direct it to a person to make it individual for them? 
and we had a comment from Skitch Ferguson who mentioned uh, using food scent oils to help stimulate appetite, and he had a fresh bread scent. Yeah, so um, the, the, I will tell you that the literature, the research is mixed on this, but from practical um, experience, just going into when you go visit your mom or your grandma and your favorite item is being um, made or baked, it creates feelings of joy. And so um, one of the things you can think about too is uh, many of you have done this for other reasons, but getting your family members to contribute recipes, favorite recipes. It's a wonderful activity, both because you have the engagement with the resident or the family, you can create recipe books, but also to be able to highlight a particular recipe, whether it's a special pie or a lemon bar, share it then as a group with activities with that resident and highlighting what that means to that person. I guess what I'm saying is anything you can think of, think of it that big, anything that creates joy and relieves distress is your non-pharmacological. Take credit for it, chart it, teach it, and in service on it. Start small, grow big, but yes, I think anything that will help that person feel more comfortable uh, for appetite. I will say music in small amounts, in small groups has also some research of increasing appetite. Thank you everybody for joining us today. Thank you Dr. Ernst for this wonderful presentation. We are just delighted that you could come back and present again. Our anyway. next, thank you, Our, we may take you up on that. <laughs> thank you everybody and have a wonderful Friday. Enjoy your weekend.